Widespread rain and the threat of storms are triggering a WRAL weather alert day. I'm tracking rain, hail, and damaging wind chances. Make your travel plans after you see our forecast. Then, happening now, we're monitoring a vote that will affect thousands of Wake County students. Where the final school reassignment plan stands right now. Then, President-elect Trump announcing new tariffs when he's back in office. Live at 7, hear from a trade expert on the possible ripple effects, including to your grocery bill. Get ready for rain on Thanksgiving because it's going to be a WREL weather alert day. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ashley Rowe. And I'm Dan Haggerty. And this uh, this isn't just about the rain. We also have the big threat of the wind. There's going to be a risk of severe th storms Thursday afternoon. All of the green areas that you see there on the map. That's what we're talking about. That's going to be area areas under threat. Uh, Kat, this is not what anybody wants to hear ahead of Thanksgiving. Well, the good news is for you, it's not going to rain nonstop all day. It doesn't look like it'll be a washout, but here's what you need to do now. Go ahead and secure any loose outdoor items, especially before you head to bed tomorrow night. It's a severe weather threat for damaging winds, perhaps some small hail. And then we're looking at the 1 to 7 p.m. time frame is the window where you're most likely to see this line of storms roll through. The severe weather threat doesn't include just our viewing area in North Carolina, but much of the southeast. So even if you are traveling out of state, you may still be impacted by these storms. For us in North Carolina, the latest high resolution model data has the bulk of the rain to our west in the mountains at 8 a.m. Thursday morning. There could be a couple of spotty showers around about a 30 percent chance at noon, but the best chance for these storms will be during the afternoon and evening. Three o'clock, you've got the main line with a few isolated cells out ahead of it. By four or five o'clock, we see those storms roll through the triangle, including Wake County. Five o'clock, approaching Johnston County as well as Fayetteville. And by seven o'clock, the leading edge of this line, that's where you've got the strong wind and that should be east of our viewing area. But then comes the much colder air. I'll let you know when highs are only in the 40s coming up. All right. Thank you, Kat. Well, the school reassignment plan in Wake County schools is all but official. The board just has to vote on it tonight, and we do expect that plan to pass. So do the families who are directly affected. WRL's Aaron Thomas is live outside that meeting tonight. Aaron, families have had to some time to process this change. Uh, why was it so controversial in the first place? Yeah, so first things first, Ashley, you know, you have a couple thousand of uh, children who have to get used to some of these changes that are pretty much uh, imminent as we wait for the board to vote. So uh, imagine that you live in a certain neighborhood and you have a school that is literally just steps away from where you live. But with these proposed uh, changes in this reassignment plan, you have some parents who worry about uh, what's normally a uh, walk to school will turn into a longer bus ride to a different school or a longer commute time to a different school. Additionally, you have families that are already used to a different type of academic calendar. So you have some that are on that traditional year calendar. You get the longer summer break between June and August. And then you have some that do the year round calendar. A lot of families, they have their work schedules and livelihoods used to a calendar that could potentially switch if you're one of the impacted families. So those who are in opposition of this, they are just used to what they have and they want things to stay as is. We have talked to families who have been dealing th with this for decades and nothing has changed. That's a, nothing has significantly has changed enough to make them not have this issue every single year, every single time this comes up. So if they vote yes, like we think that they will, we're going to keep fighting. Yeah, interesting there. Uh, Aaron, I want to get into specifics with you. What exactly are the changes uh, and why is the district saying that they're necessary? Yeah, so uh, you have, uh, we've reported several times on the population growth. You know, Wake County is definitely a location where a lot of people have their eyes on. But with that growth, you have the state's largest school district that has to uh, account for all of it. So they've opened four new schools or are planning to open four new schools. And with that, they want to fill those seats. So with those new schools that are opening up, you have more than 20 schools across all grade levels that are potentially impacted. As a result, you have a, a lot of shifting that's going to be happening. It looks like a lot of that is going to be focused on the southwestern part of Wake County. So we're talking about Holly Springs, Apex, that area that continues to see a lot of growth. Those are some of the families that are impacted. Now, the woman that you just heard from that uh, parent, uh, Caitlin Treader, she has uh, three children that are currently in Olive Chapel Elementary School. She says that she lucked out, but it's some of her friends and other neighbors that live in different neighborhoods that are impacted by some of these changes. And that's exactly why she spoke out uh, tonight ahead of a vote. 
All right, Aaron Thomas, thank you very much for your reporting tonight. This is Brian Trader in the WRA Live Center and all new here at seven o'clock. We got some video in the past hour of a fire in a Garner Industrial Park. I want to show you that video that we just got in. This happened on Hind Drive, which is just off Rayner Road on the south side of Garner. It looks like that fire happened at a sign shop of some sort. We are working to find out more about this. At this point, we haven't heard about any injuries and also no word yet on what started that fire. All right. Brian, thank you. Let us know some search warrants obtained by WRL show some new details in a deadly robbery in Durham. Two years later now, police arrested a suspect. WRL's Monica Casey dug through the documents to find out why it took so long to catch up with him. Durham police have arrested the man they say killed Jose Manuel Caceres Murillo last February. The car Jaden Tinsley got in after that shooting helped police make that arrest. Jaden Tinsley is in the Durham County Jail under a $1 million bond. Police say he shot and killed this man, Jose Manuel Caceres Murillo, in a robbery gone wrong. Police had to get warrants for surveillance camera video because the owners of the camera said they were too scared to share it. That video shows Caceres Murillo was approached by a man who pointed a gun at him. A struggle ensued and the suspect then shot him. The the warrant says that video also shows the suspect removing something from Caceres Murillo as he lay in the street and then getting in the passenger seat of a car and leaving. That car was identified as a late model Volkswagen Taos matching a vehicle stolen in Raleigh the same morning and later recovered in Hillsborough. Durham police obtained more warrants, this time for tower dump data showing where cell phone numbers are located. Police connected a cell phone number to a person who had reported their phone stolen by Tinsley, who then identified him on surveillance video in the car. Tinsley has a Mebane address and pending charges in Alamance County for assault by strangulation. He also has passed guilty pleas to drug-related charges. Police tell us based on their investigation, it does not seem he and Caceres Murillo knew each other. In Durham, Monica Casey, WREL News. We also know that Tinsley's next hearing on the first-degree murder charge is set for January. Well, Mac Brown isn't coming back. Governor Cooper vetoes a bill and a fight breaks out at Nightdale High School. Here are five things you should know right now. Multiple young people face juvenile petitions after a fight at Nightdale High School. Sky 5 flew above the scene this afternoon. The town of Nightdale says several juveniles were involved in the fight. Some had minor injuries. No weapons were involved. No surprise, Governor Cooper vetoed the bill that would bring sweeping changes to state government. This is the bill we've been talking about a lot, you know, the, the one that combines hurricane relief with shifting power away from Democrats. The way it's set up, you can't really pass one without the other. Republicans do have a veto-proof majority, so we expect the bill will become law by the end of the year. The State Board of Elections certified the election results today, except for a few super close races. Elections officials are recounting in the Supreme Court race between Allison Riggs and Jefferson Griffin. They'll also recount that super close Board of Election race in Wilson County. Do you remember this one? It's the one where the candidates are just separated by seven votes. A very cordial race that one was. Right. Recounts could be complete as early as tomorrow. Mac Brown is out at UNC almost. The university said that he will not return to the football program next year, but he will finish out this season. Just yesterday, Brown said that he did want to come back for another season next year. He has three years left on his contract. This was Brown's second stint with the Tar Heels. He ranks eighth in all college football for victories. 113 of them came at UNC. Today and tomorrow are expected to be the busiest days at RDU. The airport estimating 400,000 people will come through this week. This is why you got to book parking ahead of time. On-site spots are already about 80% full. President-elect Trump says a 25% tariff is on the way for Mexico and Canada as soon as he takes office. If he follows through with this, the ripple effect will probably reach you and me, right, at the grocery store and the gas pump. But why? Let's take a step back and look at the potential pitfalls and benefits. That conversation in about two minutes.
President-elect Trump isn't in office yet, and his agenda is already in motion. Have you seen this? This week, he promised an executive order to place a 25 percent tariff on all products coming into the United States from Mexico and Canada. Now, before we go any further, let's all get on the same page. So let's quickly just establish what a tariff is exactly. A tariff is a tax imposed by a government on goods imported from other countries. Now, the companies importing the goods pay this tax, not the foreign governments or the foreign companies. So as an example, if I make and sell suits in America and I import the fabric from Mexico, I pay the tariff to Uncle Sam when the materials go through customs. Not Mexico, not the Mexican government, not the Mexican fabric manufacturer, me, the American company. But that's just the beginning. Here to help us make sense of this a little bit more and the strategy behind these tariffs, this is Scott Lincecum. Vice President of General Economics at the Cato Institute, and you've taught international trade law courses at Duke University, something you have been practicing for two decades now. Uh, thank you, first of all, for being here tonight. Pleasure to be here. Let's talk about which products these tariffs would affect. Well, uh, according to Donald Trump's post, it would be all imports from Canada and Mexico. And so when we're really, though, when we're talking about Mexico, we talk about a lot of auto parts. We talk about a lot of fruits and vegetables, about 90 percent of our avocados about two-thirds of our tomatoes come from Mexico. Yeah. And then from Canada, you're talking about a lot of energy products, and then again, also a lot of manufactured goods as well. Well, well let me get into some of that. Okay, so Canada supplies 60% of America's petroleum imports. Uh, they're the yellow line on this graph. Over the last seven years or so, Canada passed OPEC, supplying more and more petroleum to the U.S. Now, Mexico supplies over 70% of the fresh vegetable imports, as Scott was just mentioning. This graph kind of shows something that you uh, posted on X, and this went pretty viral at the time with more than uh, half a million views. So um, you share the concerns of many economists out there that if the companies are paying the higher taxes, the higher tariffs on these goods, that it really just going to be passing that on to the consumer and right. folks like all of us will be paying more at the grocery store and various item, other items. Yeah, sure. For, especially for stuff like seasonal vegetables that you really can't get anywhere else in the country, you'd inevitably see some price hikes. And uh, tons of economic analyses from the last time we had Trump tariffs in the news show that American consumers and companies bore about 95% of those tariff costs. How quickly do you think it will happen? Well, if you saw tariffs on day one, my guess is you'd actually see retailers front-running the tariffs, so actually raising prices in advance of those announcements getting ready. We've already seen retailers like Walmart and Lowe's and others saying, look, if the tariffs come, we're raising prices. Some places are even already raising prices. Now, if this all happens, right. Trump would be going against the USMCA agreement that he enacted, that's that 2020 <laughs> trade deal, that, that Trump negotiated himself between Mexico and Canada. Right. Is there any punishment here? Well, trade agreements are voluntary among agreement, uh, governments. The Really, the only thing the other governments can do is get out of the agreements or retaliate. Canada and Mexico retaliated against American tariffs the last time we did this song and dance. Um, but the if is the big question. You know, we're not at the point where these tariffs have been imposed. So there's a chance that this is all just negotiating and all just a bluster from an uh, individual Donald Trump who's not even in office yet. Right. He does say his ultimate goal, or one of the many goals, is to bring uh, companies back into the U.S., that these tariffs will help bring manufacturing jobs back here. Here's a clip of him talking about that on the campaign trail. We're going to do things that you won't even believe. These companies are going to be begging to come back because if they don't, if they don't come back and open up plants here, they're not going to be selling their product in the United States, okay? Now, we have seen how this can potentially play out before. In 2018, Trump put tariffs on steel and aluminum. Biden then kept those in place. And as a result, employment in those industries did level out. Companies did, in some cases, move out of China. But the costs were passed on to American families, about $625 per household. And companies who use those materials lost out a lot. They lost some jobs. About 142,000 jobs were lost because of the economic impact of that. Yeah, global manufacturing is global. About half of everything we import into the United States are industrial input. So things American manufacturers use to make other stuff. 
Couple that with foreign retaliation and currency effects that harm American exporters. And at the end of the day, protectionism is a pretty bad way to help modern manufacturing. And that's especially the case for NAFTA countries, Canada and Mexico, because the supply chains are so integrated. Mm -hmm. Something like a car seat can actually cross the border five or six times before yeah. being put in a vehicle. And that just doesn't make, tariffs just don't make sense in that kind of supply chain. There have been quite a few critics about the USMCA, criticizing a variety of things. So, so I guess I'm wondering, is this really just Trump disrupting things, trying to get everybody back to the negotiating table? And, and, and this is him really signaling the clear sign yet that that's what he wants to do. It's always hard to get in Donald Trump's head. Of course. But uh, the last time we did this, uh, there were a lot of instances of the president threatening tariffs on Twitter, and then governments and companies scrambled to offer some sort of deal. Uh, the president takes his victory lap and then moves on to the next thing. And I think in this case, the most likely outcome is something like that. Go ahead. Okay. I was just wondering, you know, one of the things that uh, the president-elect has been talking a lot about, of course, is the border security. And he's, he's saying that both the northern border and the southern border have been at issue. And we have seen some numbers to be proving that. How does that, how is, how is he going to leverage that with trade? Well, it's a tough sell, honestly, because protectionism and tariffs hurt Americans, too. They hurt those supply chains. They raise grocery prices. So it's essentially uh, threatening to hurt yourself to try to get governments to change course. Now, it does hurt those countries, too. And I think the hope or the thought is that it hurts them more than hurts us, and they'll want to get to the negotiating table. And occasionally it works. But throughout history, it's not really the best way to get things done, or instead it's better to get to Together and try to work these things out without all the threats. Could tariffs be a long-term goal? You look at, for instance, steel in China, how American steel used to be something that was global, and now China seems to have a big hold of that market. And we rely on that steel a lot. Would it be over the long haul that tariffs could create more manufacturing of steel here and other places around the world? Or would we look at kind of a tariff war where all these right. countries are, are taxing each other? It's really hard to tax your way to prosperity. Um, you know, I think the, the intellectually honest argument for tariffs is that for certain goods that are national security related, we are going to accept all the costs. We're going to accept all the retaliation. We're going to accept the uncertainty that saps investment in the United States. We're going to accept all that because these are real national security issues. But in a lot of cases, when you're talking about avocados or sugar or even some industrial inputs, the national security case isn't there. So we all just end up a little poorer and a little worse off for no real gains. Wow. Scott, let's come. Thank you. I love it here at 7 o'clock. We actually let guests sit here and talk for a I while know. and educate us. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Yeah. My pleasure. Fantastic. Kat. All right, we got to get into the all important Thanksgiving forecast now. Rain is mainly going to be west of us, so when you wake up in the morning, that's the good news. As we get toward midday into the afternoon, it's going to be more spotty showers that we're tracking. It's afternoon and evening that we get the issue. It's looking like the 1 to 7 p.m. time frame would be the worst off right now. I encourage you to check in for an update tomorrow. Strong wind and hail will be possible in a couple of storms. Everybody's likely to see rain. Not everybody's going to see severe storms move through. That's why it's a level one out of five threat. A turkey trot in pretty good shape for your Thursday morning if you're a fan of those. 9 a.m., 60 degrees, just a 20% chance for rain. It's going to be kind of humid out there for the turkey trotters. Thanksgiving meal planner may be best for the early meals. As we get toward 3 o'clock, a 60% chance of storm 66. And that chance continues to climb into the later afternoon and evening hours. As we look at our severe weather risk map, most of our Viewing area is under this level one risk for Thursday. The Storm Prediction Center may whittle back that green area as we head into the day tomorrow. So check in for an update, but the chance that we could see an isolated severe storm certainly there on Thursday afternoon. For now, high pressures building in from the west. Our front from earlier today is out of here. Thanksgiving, here's the storm system. It's still out to our west, dumping snow on many of the western ski resorts tonight. They're going to get some healthy snow. As we look ahead, though, 
behind that system, we are really going to face a winter chill. chill. We're talking about a 80 to 90 percent chance of below average temperatures in early December. Starting Saturday, highs are in the 40s. We got lows in the mid 20s coming up here pretty soon, and that doesn't even account for the wind chill that will be on the way before too long. A live look outside tonight. It's a nice night in downtown Raleigh. This is a live look from the Sheraton. Beautiful with the Christmas trees set up. It's nice to see more festive cameras across the area. Now, if you're traveling tomorrow, the forecast looks great. Wednesday before Thanksgiving, always a very busy travel day. Although Thanksgiving doesn't look good for travel, at least tomorrow looks good. We've got dry weather in North Carolina throughout the day. We will see more clouds in the area tomorrow, but all around not a bad day for travel by any means. Thursday is going to be the issue during the afternoon and evening, but still not a washout. Friday, we dry out for the weekend and cool down. 49 the high on both Saturday and on Sunday, lows dip into the mid 20s Sunday night and Monday night. By next Tuesday, our high 42. A lot of questions already. We're settling into this cold pattern as of right now. It is a moisture starved pattern, so mm. we'll see if we can get any moisture around while we've got this cold air in early December. All right, thank you, Kat. One last thing tonight. Some folks who are thankful for the Carolina Hurricanes this year, not just for that comeback win last night, but for a very special delivery from the team just in time for the holiday. That's after the break. One last thing for you tonight after delivering a huge comeback win last night, the stars of the Carolina Hurricanes delivered turkeys to families in need. Oh, the team stopped by Helping Hand Mission, the Urban Ministry, and other locations with a truckload of frozen turkeys. Jordan Stahl, Sebastian Ajo, Jordan Martinook all were there. Even Stormy tagged along. Stahl and the teammates say they were happy to help. Go ahead. Everyone thinks of the holidays as a, as a great time, but you know when you're in a need, it, it can be a hard time. And um, just being able to uh, feed people and, and give them a chance to be able to celebrate with family and, uh, and give Thanksgiving is it's, it's good to be part of. And the Canes helped to deliver 1,700 turkeys for the families in our community. Well done. Thank you for making WRAL your choice for local news. Our next newscast is at 10 on Fox 50 and 11 on WRAL. Have a great night. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257.